Now, South African political parties are hard at work ahead of the upcoming elections, specifically the ruling ANC, which is trying to retain state power for its exclusive use. The Financial Mail reports that it is not clear that this will be enough to secure it the outright majority it craves, but it's unlikely to lose proximity to power. Features and cover editor for Financial Mail, Shaylee de Villiers, joins us now to look into how post-election coalitions and scenarios line up. Shaylee, an absolute pleasure as always. Good afternoon. Good afternoon to you. Well, uh, it's been very interesting reading uh, the, the, the really great uh, coverage of the election coming out of the financial mail. One of the things that really stood out here uh, is uh, analysis uh, that South Africa's electoral system was always going to lead to coalitions. Let's talk about that. Yeah, so this is the point that Stephen Friedman makes in the fantastic contribution that he made for our cover, our cover package this week. Um, and essentially looking at South Africa, is, in South Africa because of our history, we're encouraged to think about politics in big party terms, where the ANC came to, party as the party of, uh, came to power as the party of liberation. Um, the way the opposition frames the narrative as well, that if you don't vote for the, the DA, then you're wasting an ANC vote, which is not entirely true. The fact is that it's unusual to have a party that has the kind of majority that the ANC has in a democracy like ours. In similar countries, you'd find the, main, the big parties would gar garner about 25% of the vote. So, so there's a mismatch there already. What we're seeing, though, is that in South Africa, you only need about 0.25% of the vote to actually get a seat in parliament, which means that you don't need to vote for a big party to have your views represented. You can vote for a smaller party that much more closely aligns with your own particular political views. So as we move further away from 1994 and we see disaffection growing with the ANC, we see that um, you know, there's a failure of promises, we see that that liberation myth is kind of fading, there's a drop-off of support for that party, but there's also a drop-off of support for the DA and for the EFF, and we've seen the rise of smaller parties. So what we're moving to is a more natural political system where people can vote for parties that, that more closely align with their own personal preferences, and that will mean a natural turn to coalitions. And so this isn't something that we need to, as Stephen Friedman says, we shouldn't be talking about whether these are good things or bad things. The fact is they're necessary things, mm -hmm. and now we need to grapple with how to make it work. Would a different electoral system uh, be more democratic or maybe lead to different, uh, maybe different outcomes for sure, but more democratic? Um, I think that depends on what you're looking at by, by democratic. You know, one of the arguments is that we could, we could look at a constituency-based system. And there you have people voting in for particular politicians for particular areas. And the argument against that is that what you would land up with is that you would land up with fewer political parties. You would have larger majorities you would have less likelihood of coalitions, but you'd have fewer political parties. So that would encourage or disincentivize people to vote because they're not seeing themselves in their representation. So, you know, is that more democratic or not? The other option is to move more towards a system like we have at local government level where we have a mixed system, we have wards and we have proportional representation. So it would be constituency plus PR. And there, if you lose ward seats, you still pick up those votes and you can, you know, you get uh, PR seats. Um, which is perhaps a more democratic way of looking at it. It's definitely better for the smaller parties, um, but that's not going to take away this idea of coalitions. Um, if we see how it's played out at local government level now, this is where we're seeing that kind of electoral system, and that's where we're most seeing co coalition votes, or coalition governments forming. I want to also uh, speak about uh, these top three parties, the ANC, the EFF and the DA, and really uh, how they've also been speaking about coalitions. Um, they seem to all have very uh, divergent views about coalitions, uh, but I think all of it leads to what I call, uh, you know, surely a coalition scaries. <laughs> Let's talk about yeah. it. Yeah. yeah, I mean, they're all very dismissive of coalitions generally. The ANC, every opportunity it gets, will talk about how coalitions have failed, how terrible they are. The DA, as Stephen Friedman says, is kind of shouting at all the other parties in the Western Cape for, for trying to, or for daring to try and get votes there. And these are parties that it would potentially be going into coalition with. Um, the EFF seems to consider coalitions just to be arrangements where it's allowed, where other parties allow it to govern. So there isn't really a sense of taking coalition partners seriously. They're considered a problem more than a necessity. And again, it's, it's Friedman's point that we need to reimagine re how we think about coalition politics, that we need to think about these being governance arrangements rather than a party that's holding power and being propped up by smaller parties to get perks for that. 
Uh, Susan Boyson also wrote uh, as part of the package, and she speaks of, uh, you know, the passing of policies and legislations and how that might work uh, in a coalition, and also coalition proofing uh, the ANC's preferences. Let's talk about uh, her arguments and what she makes there. So what she's essentially saying is that, you know, the ANC is a bit on the ropes here. It's concerned about what's going to happen at this election. Obviously, it's deeply humiliating for it if it comes below the 50% mark. So what it's doing in the interim is it's trying to shore up its proximity to power. And so you see it putting in place its preferences around health or education frameworks. Um, you see the presidency working on a 2024 to 2029 medium term kind of planning framework. Um, but I think the central point that she's making is that things aren't going to change that dramatically after the election. If you take a look at most of the coalition scenarios, so the first one of those would be the ANC retains its majority. And that might be good for investment. It speaks to stability. In the longer run, it's questionable because, the well, because of the tra trajectory the country is on now. Um, but nothing essentially changes there. If you look at the ANC forming a minority government, this would work in its favor. It would say, okay, we don't get the full majority, but we're allowed to make all the decisions, um, obviously bar the ones where it needs to have a majority in parliament. Again, you would look at not that much changing. If you start talking about coalition scenarios, then if you're sitting at the 47, 48% mark, you're looking at the small parties becoming involved there, and that's just them bringing them on board. They're not going to have ideological um, demands. They're not going to have particular policy demands. Um, it changes more where you start coming down to the 45% the mark, the sort of midpoint. And her argument is that the IFP then becomes a, um, you know, an, an obvious partner. Um, and it might, it might just be ideological posturing that we see from that and policy posturing that it doesn't make that many demands itself. Um, MK is less likely to become a partner in that instance because of the, just the sheer animosity between the two party parties. And then if it comes to the EFF, she thinks that the two parties aren't actually all that different when you look at them anyway. The EFF is a lot of huff and puff, but how much of it is actually will you know, filter through into the way it governs. Um, the, the NC will need to be aware of the, the kind of left field EFF policy demands that come through. So if you look at the scenarios, it's largely going to you know, be more of the same mm -hmm. um, with the ANC having given itself a lot of bargaining chips and setting things up in advance as it has. We don't have much time left, but I really want to speak on what Callan wrote because he wrote about President Ramaphosa. Um, now, we know that President Ramaphosa uh, enters his second term. I don't think that there's been an ANC president that has finished his second term. Uh, you know, Tabo Beki didn't finish it, Jacob Zuma didn't finish it. Uh, let's reflect on this presidency that he that has been, um, and even what he can still do in another five years, Ashraf, if anything. I don't know. I think that Ramaphosa's, you know, my own personal opinion, Ramaphosa's um, presidency has been something of a disappointment. Mm -hmm. When he came in, there was huge fanfare. It was the, the new broom, it was the new dawn, um, it was getting rid of corruption. And it just feels as though it's been more of the same. Um, and, and there isn't sign that, that anything is, is really changing. There was hope with him, his re-election to NC president and having a less divided NEC, a less divided top six, that he'd have more room to stamp his authority on, on the situation and, and take things forward. And perhaps we'd see some movement. But still we see a man who seems to dither, who doesn't come to the party and make decisive decisions when we need them. And it's unclear that, that that's necessarily going to change. Um, when it comes to the election scenarios, it might be a different, <laughs> a different situation. If the ANC drops to, that, um, drops to under 46%, then he could very much be on the ropes. Um, he could, of his own accord, pin his resignation letter, or he could be pushed to do so. Um, if the, if, even if the party's above 50%, he might come under pressure because it's still going to be a drop from 2019. But the other possibility is that the ANC gets into an unstable coalition. Mm -hmm. And if that happens and a coalition party partner decides to put forward a vote of no confidence, that would be the end of Ramaphosa politically. Sure. Because there would be no, well, that would be the end of his second term effectively and that would be the end of his political career. What a time it's been this election season, Shirley. Thank you for unpacking this for us. It's been fantastic talking to you. That was Shirley Davilius, uh, features and cover editor for Financial Mail.